The views and content expressed on the following program are provided solely for informational and entertainment purposes. They do not constitute legal advice. A podcast is not a substitute for retaining a competent, licensed attorney to advise you on your specific legal situation. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the show. It is time for Break the Business, where we empower indie creators and have some fun along the way. I'm Ryan Carella, and it is a pleasure to have you here this week for many reasons, not the least of which is I'm in a really good mood this week, chief among which of the reasons is I've just I've gotten to do a lot of really cool stuff this week uh, in all the various hats I wear professionally. Ryan, the lawyer has had a nice week with some of the legal projects I've gotten to do. Ryan, the teacher, Ryan, the college professor, has had a great week. Uh, it is graduation re- week at Doral College, which is the co- one of the colleges I teach at. Commencement was a blast. The kids were so happy. It was just, I, I love graduations. Graduations are so cool. And, uh, you know, University of Miami, where I also teach, just finished up its semester. So I'm glad to have papers graded. That's a huge load off my shoulders. And here's a cool thing for Ryan, the broadcaster. Uh, let me talk to producer Lauren about this. Lauren, you there? I'm here. How are you, producer Lauren? I saw right before the show <laughs> that you like sprinted from off your camera into camera. What happened? Did like did something explode right as our intro song was playing? No, my little monster dog kicked the door open and I could like hear the TV being watched in the other room and uh, so I had to run over to like close the door behind the little dog who has now decided to like sit at the door and be like, "Can I get back out now?" I could. I could get back out. It's like, oh, you're doing that podcast? Don't let me get out of here. Uh, no, he loves being in here during the podcast. It's oh. like he sits, he sleeps on the day bed across from me in the office, and he just like sleeps the whole podcast. And as soon as we're done, I'm still talking to you guys, so I have no idea how he knows we're done. But as soon as the podcast is over, he gets up, and my other dog is standing at the door, and they're like, can we go for a walk now? We know you're done. They I mean, have like, your schedule down packed. The tone of your voice changed and you're no longer on like broadcast mode. And now I can tell you're talking backstage so you can wrap it up and we can go for our walk. Wow. Yeah, dogs have those really great internal clocks. Uh, I wanted to bring you in because I wanted to tell you what Ryan, the broadcaster, got to do earlier this week because this was very, very neat. As you know, Lauren, our satellite radio home for Break the Business is Sirius XM 145, as you pointed out there on the camera, Slam Radio. I got to hang out at the Slam Radio station earlier this week. I did three hours on the Good Morning Amigo Morning Show. Uh, Um, They brought me in. We were talking about Break the Business. Oh, he does a five-hour show every morning. It's yeah, he it is a it is a quite a production. So I, I sat in for the three hours there with Larry, but it's a five hour show. But it's I, I got to tell people like the behind the scenes of Good Morning Amigo on Sirius XM 145, because it is pretty amazing as a production undertaking. All right. So Larry Milian is the faculty director at Slam Radio. It is the only Sirius XM satellite radio station run by high school students. The high school students re- re- operate the station. They're on air. They're off air. And this teacher, this very experienced, dedicated broadcast professional, he's been in the business for a long time, Larry Million. It's his job to herd all the cats and make sure that <laughs> somehow a show, you know, 24 hours a day of content gets out on that station. And we're just one program on Slam Radio that the kids help produce, and it's great for us. But one of the things that he does is he hosts this morning show. But he's still a teacher this whole time. So while he's doing the show, he's teaching a class. He's taking attendance. He's giving out assignments. And it's a surreal experience to be in this studio because it's the complete opposite of this, right? This <laughs> ours, The studio here at Break the Business, it's just our microphones in our office, bedroom, whatever. With this our dogs. Is like, this right. is a real, with our dogs, this is a real <laughs> professional studio, but it's huge because it's also a classroom. So you're there at the uh, console with, with the co-hosts and everything. And then there's, you know, rows of student desks and all the kids like have microphones that 
And so at any time, any of like the 35 kids in the class can chime in on the air and talk about something. And so I'm sitting there at the console and I got like kids asking me questions about Ed Sheeran and copyright law and AI because they're interested in that stuff that we talk about on Break the Business. You know, they hear they hear it each week because they're producing the show, editing the show. And they're like, hey, we got the guy in here. Let's talk to him about it. And it was just cool just hanging out with the kids. They're so good at what they do. I wish I had the talent that these young people had at their age. I wish I had their talent now, frankly. But they're just really, really special kids. And it was cool to be in there. We got to talk a little sports, too. I told Larry, I was like, look, if I'm going to come in here and talk about music, you got to let me do some sports talk as well. I want to be like you, Larry the Amigo. And he let me do a little bit of sports talk with him. And that was a blast. And it was just so much fun. What a cool experience. And I'm I'm so glad that I got to be a part of it. I'm so glad that we're part of this really innovative forward thinking radio station. With a great group of of not only the students, but the teachers like you're talking about. It's a it's a team of people committed to uh educating. I mean, even what we do on this show is is hopefully educating while having some fun. But uh it's it's cool to see an entire program designed around things that are interesting to the students and slam radio has been around long enough now that we're starting to see the first crop of graduates who are now getting jobs in the radio business Uh, there is a slam radio grad who now works for sirius xm and was actually howard stern's board op when howard stern was making a, a couple shows here in miami recently so shout out to Larry the Amigo Million, shout out to Frank Fernandez and everybody over at Slam Radio who's just doing some really incredible stuff. And thanks for giving us a satellite radio home because it's been an absolute blast. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say it, their facilities uh, kick the crap out of our facilities. Uh, things are kind of going well for you as a teacher mm-hmm. as well, Lauren. You were telling me that you got a pretty big going show tomorrow. I'm well? excited to go to it. Can you tell us about this? Okay, there's a few problems with that sentence. One was going well two was <laughs> big show uh <laughs> we are very much enjoying the show uh there's a school i have been working with that and this is probably par for the course a lot across the country now um does no no longer has a theater program there are no theater classes there is no theater department there is no physical theater um and they brought me in because there are a group of students. There is a, my grammar is terrible. I'm sorry. Uh, there is a group of students. It's the end that, of the school year. We're all exhausted. <laughs> so in case he didn't mention, I have a show tomorrow. So my brain fried. Um, <laughs> but they, this, there's a group of students that was still committed to competing, to keeping the National Honor Society for Thespians open and for still doing production. So they asked me to come in and help them out. Um, and I tried to go with the smallest, most inclusive, best known show, um, which we will be doing a production of Jonathan Rand's Check Please, which Ooh. is the number one perf- most performed one act play for the last 16 years straight. Great fit like, for high school theater, this for guy's- sure. Oh yeah, it's such a great show. And in my director's note, I use the word schadenfreude just because I really wanted to. Um, and it seems so appropriate for that show. You're sitting there laughing at terrible dates. It's just like, yeah, this is awful for them. Yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why not? But in any case, so we've got a show that was like a half hour show that's, you know, maybe a 20 minute show. And so I'm trying to milk the entire night. But again, they don't have a theater. They don't have a space. And I've told them and taught them that as opposed to going to slam radios facility where you have a top of the line everything they don't even have like a room (laughs) so we were in the media center today putting up lights and trying to hook up sound and trying to get these kids to have an opportunity to know what it's like to have a microphone on you and lights on you while you're trying to do those scenes that you've been rehearsing for the last few weeks um and in the setup time to do that, we got as far as setting up. Uh, but I believe that their first full run through with an audience uh, is also going to be their first full tech dress rehearsal. That is that is high school theater, <laughs> if I've ever heard it. it true uh, it. Bill O'Reilly effort will do it live. <laughs> oh, man. And we're like, 
I mean, you know what this is like because you you dealt with this through me. <laughs> but by and you're like pulling people out of like the woodwork. You're like, oh, like you got a friend who can totally you you know somebody who will wear a burlap sack, right? Your brother, he's great. Bring him in. He's gonna play guy in the burlap sack. That's that's gonna be awesome. You're just like randomly grabbing kids around the high school. You're in the play now. Oh yeah, the girl who's stage managing her brother literally took over a role yesterday. <laughs> oh my god. We're big on family affairs, um, but we have all the characters. But you you knew what that was like. You were my brother, and I dragged you into that stuff. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, we were talking about this a little bit before the show, and I, I you know, love sharing this phenomenon. Now, as I have <laughs> a new baby boy, right, and I, and I talk to my wife about, like, what clubs are we going to put him into? What, are, what co-curriculars? What sports? And she's thinking... Oh, we'll get him on the baseball team or the basketball team or, you know, uh, some kind of cool masculine activity. And what I'm trying to explain to my <laughs> wife is I'm not bringing our child the genetics required to be on the basketball team or the baseball team. Abandon those dreams now. And those things can be very competitive. And so I, I told my wife, look, you got a son. If you want him to be able, if, if, if you're looking for a, extracurricular activity for him to do at school where he's going to be able to rise to the top simply because there's just a shortage of guys who want to do it. Theater is where you got to go. The demand for guys in theater is strong and the supply is weak. And so you can get like a great reward. You can get like up to the top you can make it to the top just for showing up even if you just have showing up no mm -hmm. experience or skill I, I showed you this tweet lauren which is still one of my all-time favorite tweets that i still quote to this day even though this tweet's got to be like 10 or 15 years old do you have it there can we put yeah, this up yeah it's yeah it's, yeah it's tiny but it has yeah it here. can you read that for us it it's, says high school girls in musicals I've been going to theater camp since first grade and taking professional voice lessons since I was 10. I am so excited to be townsperson number three this spring. <laughs> High school boys in musicals. The drama teacher cornered me after Algebra 2 and said I had to be Shrek. Yes, that is, that <laughs> exemplifies high school theater I, I i know because you 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 are you were the high school theater kid and by the way you were the person with like the years of tap <laughs> oh, and yeah. singing lessons and everything else and i was the guy who gets cornered into algebra and i'm the living embodiment of this tweet and lauren you know this um we both are we so in, <laughs> in both sides of it frankly um in ninth grade i was the lead in a high school production of the Fantastics, I mean, you know, a lot of people know this. You know, most one of the most popular musical theater shows. It had like this long run off Broadway and on Broadway for a bit. Jerry Orbach, El Gallo, everybody knows. And so, a lot of people are thinking, "Wow, you were the lead in the Fantastics as a Ooh. freshman. You must be a stellar talent, once in a generation." What I'm telling you is, no, no, no. I'm the guy who showed up. Because, like, me being the lead in the, like, the, here, here is how I got to be the lead in the Fantastics. I'm playing Madden football in my bedroom one day after school. Lauren, my sister Lauren, producer Hi. Lauren, comes into my bedroom and says, and throws, like, a book of monologues on my lap and says, you're auditioning for this play. The director says, I can't audition unless I bring a guy to audition. <laughs> You're going to memorize a monologue on the drive there and and you're going to audition for this show. And Lauren got cast in it because she's amazing and talented Aww, and thanks. lots of experience and lessons. And again, I got cast in the lead because I was their only option. We needed guys. We now, needed guys. To now, take it a step further, which you didn't even fill them in, is we didn't even attend this school. No, like, we really, couldn't. That's they a good point. Yes. They couldn't we even find even guys at their in the own school. school. Like they had to bring guys in from another school. I was a mercenary. <laughs> so now here's the other side of this tweet. Because you might be thinking, who, you know, to, to further like show that this is the exemplification of this tweet, who might you wonder was playing the opposite role to my lead role? Who was my love interest? For those who know the Fantastics, you might be asking, who was the Louisa to my Matt? And the answer is, you might know her as Chrissy Fit, who uh, you might know her. She's been on a bunch of Disney Channel shows, and she was one of the Bellas 
in the Pitch Perfect series opposite Anna Kendrick and Rebel Wilson and all of those people. So She's that's everything. The far, what is that left? The far yeah. left on the picture. There you go. So that's everything you need to know about high school theater and, <laughs> and what it takes to get there. All right. If you want to be the lead in high school theater as a guy, you show up. Show you up. want to be the lead in high school theater as a girl, you need to be one of the Bellas. And this wasn't even like a really impressive performing arts school. This was just a high school. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's how contentious these things are. And yeah. so, yeah, if you have a son and you're looking for a club to get them into because you just want them to be like the top of it, theater, theater, you got theater, theater, theater. You've got dance, dance and you've got that other fun activity you did, which would be cheerleading. Oh, you need that's a whole other conversation but here's the but thing I'm just saying like that like guys in the arts right in the performance arts there is a shortage yeah well, and dare you... i say even like a shortage that play straight male well um is a, a whatever you come in and fine but like to play those characters written for those roles in high school when you're still trying to fit is really difficult to find guys yeah. But you talked about dance, and dance is another version of this. Yeah. But for a guy to like get cast in dance, like you have to have Training. some modicum of dancing ability. <laughs> you have to have a, a, an element of rhythm. Fair enough. What I'm saying is to be a guy in theater, you just have to be able to project. Learning like, your lines they're, is helpful. They're in, yeah, you, gotta, you, you need to know how to read a script. But like, I'm sure my audition, they're going, well... This guy ain't hitting the notes, but at least the notes are hitting the back of the theater. Lead roll. And that's all it takes. Anyway, so um, you you had actually met, like, we actually gotten into this conversation because you were, like, wondering why, like, there was a Pitch Perfect 2 advertisement on your TV that you were so, saying. Like, I Pitch Perfect's mind, back. I don't mind seeing Chrissy fit often. I love her. She's wonderful. She's and a just treasure. just a joy to be in the room with. And infinitely patient at the age of, like, 18 years old to, like, handle my, like, 15 year old self and like carry me through that production like lebron was like carrying mario chalmers through all those heat championships he's not giving himself enough credit he did a good job <laughs> serviceable didn't fall off the stage no you did you look good in the pictures i mean we have no recordings because that's not you legal because look- <laughs> we've destroyed all copies um <laughs> but like it keeps so she keeps appearing in my life and i haven't seen her in years now because she's out in la la land um, and I turned on the TV before the show to see if we could keep the heat game on in the background and I turn it on and it's a giant ad for pitch perfect too. And I was at my friend's five-year-old's birthday party two days ago. And in his living room, like the hold screen on the screen was a big ad for pitch perfect too. And I was like walking through a store and there's like apparently. a print of the pitch perfect too. I'm like, okay, hold on. We're not going pitch perfect series. We're not going like any of the newer ones. Like Pitch Perfect 2 is everywhere right now, and I don't understand it. Like, what a random thing. I, I don't know how these ads work, because I, I think it's probably some kind of personalized algorithm. Like, something in your viewing habits has made this AI go, she needs to be fed an ad for Pitch Perfect 2. It, it it's all probably comes back because to we talk so much about Chrissy Fit on this podcast. <laughs> it's looking, it's like, oh, she likes her. She wants to, she, she should send her a message. I'm just going to put her <laughs> face in your screen. <laughs> Well, we have other things to talk about on this program other than high school theater, if you can believe it. We have an it. awesome guest. We do have an awesome guest. He's going to be joining us in the next segment. Excited to talk to Ross James. He is the venue booker for Ophelia's Electric Soapbox, a legendary venue in Denver. And right now our co-host Zach Sloan is so pissed that he's not here this week because he would have very much loved to make that connection. But we'll we'll send a... Ross James's info because that's a good band for for any Denver venue booker to know is a uh, uh, Zach Sloan's band. We're going to talk about uh, CD Baby's new announcement for its uh, copyright API. That's very cool. Twitch has got some great news. We got the AI Overlord tip of the week, and all the while I'm going to try not to think about the fact that the Heat are playing a playoff game right now that I would very much like for them to win. It's going to be a blast of a show. We get to hang out with producer Lauren the whole time. What more could you ask of life? I'm excited. Yeah. Let's talk about our friends at CD Baby. Okay. And and I do I do mean that when I say our friends. We have had CD Baby people on Break the Business a number of times. We love Kevin Bruner. We love um the you know the the CEOs over there. We love Chris Robley. Lots of folks that we just dig over at CD Baby because 
They are the originals. You know, they right now you can't swing a cat without hitting some platform <laughs> that's going to I love that expression. <laughs> Sorry. Without hitting a platform that's going to distribute your music, right? Like you you know, if you want to get your music on Spotify, there's a billion options out there. But mm-hmm. CD Baby was the original. Like they were the first folks to come out there and say, "We are going to give the common indie artist access to their music fans. We're going to get your music on Spotify. And before that, it was, we're going to get your music on iTunes. And before that, they were literally CD baby. They would make you CDs and print them in mass and get them to you, get them out to distribution outlets. And they put that in the reach of the common independent musician. They were the originals and they're still around today and they're still innovating. And I'd love to talk about their latest uh, Leonard Patterson saying we love CD Baby. Well, you know what? We love yeah. Leonard Patterson. Uh, <laughs> break the business guest. Fantastic human who just sent us a nice little comment there. Um, CD Baby is is very, very cool. And they're still innovating. And they're innovating with another one of our friends. So another platform that we've loved to talk about around here is a platform called Cosigned. That's C-O-S-Y-N-D. They are a run by a terrific uh, CEO named Jessica Sobraj, who we've had on this podcast before. And what a cosign does is they make copyright registration easy peasy. I've always said that unlike most things that are involved with dealing with the government, registering your copyright is not actually that hard. But it can be a little bit challenging if you have to go to the website and you have to know what information to type into the form. But now with Cosign, there is a tech solution that you can go online, pay a reasonable fee, and Cosign will register your copyright for you. And about five years ago, I want to say, maybe three to five years ago, however long it was, uh, CD Baby and Cosign became purchased by a common owner, Downtown Music Holdings. And for all of that time, I was wondering, what are they get, What are they doing? What's the plan? What, what's the? There's You're something going something. on here. Yeah. There's there. You know, you don't just buy a you know the world's biggest music distribution service and this copyright registration service unless you're going to do something cute with them. Right? You don't just leave those two things alone. But I did. But we hadn't heard anything about these two platforms being combined or or brought together in some way until this week when it was announced that CD Baby is now going to be partnering with Cosign to allow CD Baby users to access Cosign's copyright registration services through an API right on CD Baby. So what does this mean? If you're distributing your music through CD Baby, you're getting your music on Spotify, you're getting it on Pandora, you're getting it on iTunes, etc. Now, instead of registering your copyrights by going to the copyright office and doing all of that separately, You can now set up the copyright registration for your music while you're setting up the music distribution for your music all through CD Baby. So it just becomes one more step on CD Baby. Saves you time, saves you money, and it's just, it allows to, it creates just a one-stop shop for everything that you need to do to get your music out there. And CD Baby's already kind of embraced this one-stop shop approach because now if you're an indie creator and you want to get your music out there, and you use CD Baby, you can set up the distribution through CD Baby, and you could always do that. But they also have a partnership with Song Trust, the independent music publisher, where you can set up your publishing through CD Baby, through its CD Baby Pro Publishing service. So you're doing all of that on the same platform, right? You're getting paid as a songwriter, you're getting paid as a featured artist, you're getting paid as the owner of the masters, all on one platform. And now with this new announcement, while you're doing all of that, you're also going to be able to set up your copyright registration without leaving the CD Baby platform through this API. And again, we haven't been paid to say any of this. We're not getting like a, a check from CD Baby. I just think this is so cool and innovative, and it's going to save artists a lot of time and simplify the music distribution process for them. I love it. Can it? It's, I haven't followed up on this yet, but can it track it and keep records of it for you as well? Like when you open your CD baby account, does it show you the things that you have copyrights on or something that's pending or what you filed? Like, does it keep it all in one place for you too? Well, one of the things that I asked when I, when I heard about this story, first thing I did was reach out to the folks over at CD baby. And I was like, I need all the details you can give me, give me, give me, this is cool. I want to cover it this week shower me with details. Mm-hmm. And they had come back and said, we're working on it because <laughs> this, <laughs> this feature is not available yet. They've only announced it. And so I was like, can you send me some visual assets? I want, I can put them up there. Like we don't have those yet, but 
it's all coming. And so what I'm guessing is, because I do know enough about the co-signed platform to know what it looks like. And yes, co-signed, when you use co-signed to register your copyrights, it will give you like a running tally of what the status is of your registrations. So assuming if the API is going to look in CD Baby the way it looks in co-signed, I assume it will be able to do what you're talking about, Lauren, where you'll be able to keep track of your yes. copyright registrations, have it all in one place, and know exactly what your music status is at any given time, which is actually really valuable. Because yeah, for because keeping separate files where you're like, okay, here's my things, here's where they're getting distributed, here's who's got this, and wait, 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 where's the paperwork that shows oh, I have yeah. the where's rights the registration to that thing? Hold certificate. on, we put that remember, somewhere yeah. over here, like together is good. Yeah. Um and it is nice because searching for your copyright registrations on the copyright office website sucks. Mm. Like that the copyright office website looks like it was programmed in GeoCities in 1995. And they were like, yeah, we don't need to update this. The search functionality is a disaster. It is the bane of entertainment lawyers like mine, my existence. And so, yeah, Cosign is going to hopefully make it look very, very pretty and allow you to keep track of your copyrights while also keeping track of your publishing through CD Baby Pro Pub Publishing, while also being able to keep track of your distribution through CD Baby's standard distribution service. I love every piece of this. Now, you might be wondering, and we want to talk about this before we bring in Ross James. Why do you care about copyright registration? Why do we add this to the list of things? And I think it is worth it to talk a little bit about the advantages to why you register your copyrights. Because it's not intuitive. Especially because I'm about to tell you <laughs> that you have a copyright from the moment you create a work. That mm -hmm. is the federal law. When you create a work, when you write out sheet music, when you record something into a recorder... As long as you fix that work into some kind of tangible medium, like a piece of paper or a computer's hard drive, boom, you have a copyright. So why register it? Well, registration gives you a ton of really important legal advantages that help you protect this property, this copyright that you've created. One, presumption of legal ownership. Now, if, somebody, if you want to sue somebody for infringement, you don't have to prove that you own the copyright. You just show the registration, and now it's up to the other side to prove that you don't own a copyright. The burden of proof shifts. You also get statutory damages, which are if you uh, win an infringement suit and your work is registered, which are much higher than actual damages. They're easier to prove. You don't have to prove the damages. You get the damages that are already listed in federal law, and you also get attorney's fees if you win. Ooh. So now... The other side, if you win, has to pay your attorney's fees, so, which will make it much more likely that an attorney will take your case for copyright infringement. Mm. So registering copyrights is important. And thanks to our friends over at CD Baby and Cosigned, it's become just a little bit easier. So that's worth checking out. Uh, keep an eye on that. If you are looking for a music distribution option, CD Baby might be worth considering because they do make your copyright life a little bit easier. And I thought that one way we could uh, further exemplify the importance of copyright registration, Lauren, is through our AI Overlord Tip of the Week. 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 As we speak, Producer Lauren, the mm -hmm. Miami Heat are currently locked in an epic Game 1 Eastern Conference semifinal or Eastern Conference Finals battle against the dreaded Boston Celtics. How is that going, by the way? Do we have any good report there? I My screen is black. I didn't know. Uh, it's like... Well, aren't I don't even want to know. Aren't you going up to the land of the, like, villains? Like, the you're going to the Boston area, right? I am. I'm going to be on vacation there this How weekend. How is that happening? Sorry. I don't know. When it's, as soon as you said Boston, my brain was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" Yeah, yeah, we're going. <laughs> yeah, the, but the game is very much on my mind, and I figured, I don't know if the Heat are winning or they're losing right now, either. but however they're doing, I think they could benefit from a little bit extra motivation. And I've seen enough sports movies, producer Lauren, <laughs> to know that nothing makes a team more successful and more guarantees victory than when the coach gives that rousing speech at halftime <laughs> to motivate the team. No sports movie is complete without the, 
coach giving the rousing halftime speech, and then the players get all riled up and they go out there and they win the game. And so I think the Heat need a speech like that. Okay. But since this is the AI overlord tip of the week, we're going to combine that important sports speech with some tips for indie creators. So what we're going to do, what we had the AI overlord put together this week is a motivational halftime speech from a coach that also includes advice on why it is important for artists to register their copyrights. Okay. Does that make sense? Did I cover that well enough? I think we got there. All right. Debating whether we're mixing in sports stuff with the Indian sh- stuff or if we're gonna have like a coach being like all right musicians get out your guitars but we'll find out man how did like did. you pretty much have the script already that's that's is basically that what, what we do well you'll oh. you'll see it i think i think it'll it'll become pretty obvious all right so here okay. we go, go for it. this is the a overlord tip of the week this is and we got some like motivational sports music behind it because we <laughs> want really want to embrace that halftime sports movie feel so here we go <clears throat> gather round team I need you to listen, and I mean really listen. It's halftime, and we're down, but we've been down before, haven't we? And that hasn't stopped us. Let me tell you something about this game. This game, it's like your creative work. Each play, each move you make, it's unique. It's your creation. And just like when you're protecting a lead in a game, you got to protect your creative work by registering your copyrights with the Copyright Office. Now you might ask, why register, coach? Why go through the top trouble? Well, let me tell you why. If someone infringes on your work, your registered copyright is your shield and your sword. That registration can protect you and it can help you fight back. And not just for bragging rights, but for statutory damages and attorney's fees. I want you to think about what you poured into your work. Your blood, your sweat, your tears, late nights, early mornings, the passion, the creativity, the unique spark within each and every one of you. It's worth protecting. It's worth defending. So don't let anyone tell you your work isn't worth it. Don't let anyone take what you fought so hard to create. You are artists, innovators, pioneers. You are the lifeblood of our culture. You deserve to have your work, your effort, your brilliance recognized and protected. Now let's get out there and play that second half like it's the last we'll ever play. Let's register those copyrights. Let's fight for what's ours. We're not just a team, we're creators. And we're gonna fight for every idea, every story, every creation, just like we're gonna fight for every point in the second half. We're going out there as a team but we're coming back as champions. Clear eyes, full hearts, registered copyrights, can't lose. Let's do this. Who's with me? I am. Yeah. (laughs) I'm pumped. I'm going to log right on to CD Baby whenever they open this platform and register. (laughs) And we're going to use that Cosine API whenever it comes out. Whenever it comes out. Yeah. And we're going to tune in to break the business to find out when that is. That's right. <laughs> and in the meantime, we're going to talk to Ross James, the booker at Ophelia's Electric Soapbox. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Break the Business. Ryan Corella here. I hope you're enjoying the show, and I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. I do what I do because I care about creators like you. A lot. I've dedicated my career to helping creative professionals, entrepreneurs, and organizations move forward. I do it by hosting this program, and I'm also proud to do it in my legal practice. If you're a creative professional looking for solutions-oriented legal services to help you further your goals, I'd love to help. My firm RKPA does contracts, commercial law, copyright, trademark, and more. Visit rkpalaw.com to learn more. That's rkpalaw.com. Ryan A. Corella, PA, Miami, Florida. Streaming services for Break the Business provided by L.E.K. Entertainment. L.E.K. Entertainment is a full-service entertainment company offering everything from consultations to full-scale events and productions, including 
audio and video productions, voiceovers, staged theatrical productions, script and music development, and streaming services. For more information, visit lekentertainment.com. L.E.K. Entertainment wants to help you bring your story to life. Thanks for supporting Break the Business. If you have a question or topic that you want us to discuss, email us at breakthebusiness at gmail.com. You can follow the host, that's me, on Twitter at Ryan K-A-I-R, and you can follow the show at The BTB Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, and on all major podcast platforms. And now, let's get back to the show. That coach speech gave me a headache, and now my voice hurts. Maybe I should have done that at the end of the show. Welcome back to Break the Business, everybody. Ryan Carella here with producer Lauren, having a fantastic time on all major podcast platforms, streaming platforms, and on Sirius XM 145, wherever you're checking us out. And there's just way too many places to check us out. But wherever you're checking us out, we're happy to have you there and uh, happy to be bringing out our guest this week. He is an acclaimed booker. For the legendary Denver music venue, Ophelia's Electric Soapbox. Our guest has also managed tours for Phil Lesh and has worked as a sound engineer and musician for countless music legends. You can find out more about our guest's work by visiting Ophelia'sDenver.com. We are happy to welcome Ross James on to Break the Business. Hi, Ross. Hey, what's going on? So you saw that bit we did and you didn't immediately run away. <sighs> I'm still here. You yeah. might be our kind of person. <laughs> I was watching too. I was like, is he my little He was thinking about it. He's like, where's that where's that mouse? Let me just let me just draft an email, quickly right, fire right, my publicist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, man. That was good information there. That's good info. Well, uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. The audience that's on the radio can't see it, but whenever there's like fun eye candy behind our guest, it's like mm. an ADD dream. Like I'm sitting here being like, oh, what's that? Yeah. Okay, what's going on over there? There's a lot of that in this room for sure. Yeah. You've got like <laughs> toys and gear and yeah. like, yeah, fun. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe at some point during this interview, Lauren, we got to get a little uh, tour of some of the stuff he's got behind us because... I mean, I'm that. looking at that baseball right there. I bet that's probably been autographed by somebody oh, pretty cool. I was I'm trying just to figure guessing. out how many guitars were in the back because it's like hard to. I'm telling you, there's like, a few. Yeah. He's he's Denver, so I'm guessing that ball. What Larry Walker? It's uh, Todd actually, Helton. It's Doc Ellis. Ooh. Whoa! Oh, it's like that now, is it? Um. All right. So let's talk about your venue. Yeah. Because I, I was looking at some pictures of it. Obviously, its reputation precedes us. Uh, it's legendary. The Ophelia's Electric Soapbox dates back to the Victorian era. And it's got a lot of Victorian feel still in it. It once housed a brothel That's and right. a peep show. And I believe the venue yeah. still has the old peep show booths in it. I don't know if they're still in operation, but you they're know, there, I, right? I haven't I haven't seen those. I'm not quite sure. Um if they've been converted to the restrooms downstairs possibly. That could be it's a different kind of peeping, but yeah, sure. Something like that. <laughs> he, he's uh, in them. He's just not on the side where the peep hole is. So he's not uh, aware of the other people. <laughs> well if you don't know where they're the peep booths you. are, then you're the one being peeped on. I, I, suppose, would exactly. I suppose yeah. <laughs> but like I mean it it must just you must really dig getting to book a venue that just it, it's that's so different from all the other ones out there. It's not antiseptic. It's got like a real feel and culture. And especially as live music becomes more homogenized and cookie cutter, mm -hmm. it must give you a lot of satisfaction to know that you're booking for a place that when the musicians go there, they're going to get an experience unlike any other. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's it's a really special place. And, you know, my introduction to it was actually playing there, <clears throat> I guess, seven years ago, six, seven years ago. Um, I was I was playing with Phil, who you mentioned we had played Red Rocks, and then the next day we did like an unannounced kind of special show at this club Ophelia's, and I'd never heard of it, and we were all just sort of blown away. And fast forward, I ended up meeting my wife on that trip, but not at Ophelia's, and she is the uh, vice president of the restaurant group that sort of owns Ophelia's. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all sort of got intertwined, and I became a part of it. But I, I guess the point is I've seen it from, you know, the artist perspective. I've gone and seen shows there before I was working there. And then also kind of having my hand in, in the booking, it's been really cool to to see it from all angles and, um, you know, get all the feedback from everybody that comes in. And it's pretty much universally, this is the best venue this size we've played, you know, 
That's really a cool spot. It seems pretty obvious when you look at the pictures of it. That is a cool place to play, and it's yeah. got to be a pretty cool place to watch a show. Mm -hmm. You, you, I saw you have the Dres Dresden Dolls coming this weekend. That's pretty exciting. Who is the favorite guest that you've ever booked? I'm, I'm going to make you pick one. I know, like your first instinct is going to be like, "There, I love them all equally. They're my children." Like, what's no. what's the guest that you're like? I can't believe we got these folks. I mean, you know selfishly my favorite would be bill frizzell the jazz guitar player that we had oh. you know it's really cool having it, it's one of the unique things about that room is you can put anything in there you can put hard rock you can put electronic dance music you can put cover bands jazz music anything and the bill frizzell show was really special i mean he's just you know one of my favorites and um one of the first people I reached out to when I sort of got the keys to the car here and uh, <laughs> it was cool to get him in for sure. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. You look at that venue. It's like, yeah, that can play to a lot of different genres for sure. Like a mm -hmm. lot of different styles can just feel very comfortable in a, or maybe they all just feel equally strange in a venue that looks right. as, as eclectic <laughs> as that one, but at least they're all on the same page there. Let me get the booker's perspective on something. Because whenever we have venue bookers here, and we've had some pretty cool ones, uh, you know, walk through uh, this particular program, I love to ask them this same question or some version of it from the indie creator's pers perspective. A lot of indie artists are looking to book these kind of mid-sized venues. Mm -hmm. They want to get an opportunity to play in places like this, but maybe they don't have a lot of the trappings that an artist may usually have that allows them to book a venue like yours more easily. Maybe they don't have a traditional booking agent. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have a, you know, a, a lot of the a big label support and things like that for an artist who is doing things truly independently, doesn't have a, a booker to help get them booked at a place like yours. Is there anything you might recommend that they do to get your attention to maybe uh, get a date at your venue? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the, you just got to keep, keep going for it and not like giving up and, and trust that you're putting out like the real authentic thing and all that stuff will kind of line up. You know, my, my preference is to not work with agents or really? managers, you know, in general. I mean, that's, I, I mean, I like, like, like you were saying, I've kind of done every, everything there is to do in the music industry on a, all kinds of levels. And, um, you know, I'm a big, one of the things I'm trying to do there is keep as much money in the right people's pockets as possible. So like a good example of that is this past weekend, we had a band called Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, um, a really great sort of modern bluegrass, bluegrass, you know, jam band kind of thing from Wisconsin. And I'm, I'm friends with just, you know, on a personal level with the lead singer. And we've been talking for months about trying to do something and it was just him and I that cooked it up, you know? So, you know, there's, there's other examples of shows that we've done that have started in that sort of grassroots guerrilla way of kind of going against the grain of the traditional machine that sort of runs the show these days, you know? And if the artist doesn't have an agent or a manager mm -hmm. and, and you don't <laughs> listen to those people anyway, how does how does an artist get your attention? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's just on the website, one of the things that we sort of advocated for, I advocated for was just, you know, you could go to send an email to booking at Ophelia'sDenver.com, right? And that that goes straight through. So it's not like there's some wall around us where you have to break through to get in. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that comes through and you know, I I try to, you know, go through it as much as possible and stay on top of it and you know, really try to find the, the, the stuff in there that would be a good fit for the room and, and a fun thing to work with, you know, it's a nice development. I've seen a lot of bookers start to take that approach being mm -hmm. a lot more accommodating toward direct solicitations. Although when I have spoken to bookers who do it your way, they'll say like, I, I sift through a lot of mm -hmm. bad pitches, right? Maybe an artist who, I can tell they've just written me the same stock kind of, sure, yeah. you know, letter that they're probably sending to a hundred different bookers. And it still has the other venue's name. Still has the other venue's name on it. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so I mean, what, you know, knowing that your time is finite mm -hmm. and it's precious and they maybe only have a few seconds to light you up in that first, you know, message that they send. What are some of the things that 
is helpful for you to see right away in that message that's going to get your attention. Yeah. I mean, you know, if we live in an age of, you know, there's so much content out there. So like videos are really a great way to digest stuff. So, you know, uh, having, having the sort of links easily accessible right there and, and maybe sort of describing what they are or, or, you know, I, I feel like tone in an email is a hard thing to, you know, convey the right way and attention to that, you know, making it personal. And if it feels real and authentic and not just, you know, we played this place and this place, like you're just like sort of doing what you think you're supposed to be doing. Um, that's sort of the stuff that, that rings true. And what's cool about Ophelia's too, is it's not just like, we don't just book stuff on a Friday and Saturday where we're trying to pack the place and that's the only option. You know, we do, we do shows, smaller scale shows on weekdays. We do brunch shows on Saturday and Sunday. So there's lots of opportunity for, you know, acts of all different levels to kind of, you know, get on stage there. Lauren, I noticed when I was looking, I was, when I was just researching what Ross does, he was talking about brunch uh, parties. Like he, Ross, especially since the pandemic has, brought in a lot of different eclectic event ideas to kind of bring people into Ophelia's. And so, I mean, I've read, you know, you you talked about the live brunch shows, you have Y2K dance parties that I read. I'm not quite sure what those are, but that sounds pretty exciting. Uh, Can you talk about just some of the unique events that you've put on at this venue uh, uh, since the pandemic? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a different climate, right? You know, um, people, I think it's starting more and more to kind of get back to, whatever normal was beforehand, but like people were a lot more selective about when they would go out. Right. It had to be something, you know, that they knew would be a sure thing. People didn't want to take like maybe because they weren't going out as often. They were kind of easing back into things. They wanted to know they were going to have a good time. And which is why I think we've seen across the board, you look at every venue, this size, anywhere in the country, everybody's doing, you know, cover bands, everybody's doing theme DJ nights, all these kinds of things. Right. And it's, it's just, people want a good time. It's, 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 it's a little different. So I'm trying to incorporate as much, you know, art, let's say original music, people who are passionate about their creation and also balance the kind of things that are going to bring people to the club to, to sustain the business. And also, keep everybody happy. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome when there's, you know, 400 people and they're having a great night. So, you know, you talked about the Y2K thing. Um, There's a a DJ in town, DJ AL, who runs this night called Hype. And, you know, we do it monthly and it's, it's one of the biggest nights every month for us. He did New Year's for us last year and we did the theme of the New Year's was, you know, 99 to Y2K. So at midnight, you know, like the power went out, right? And all, <laughs> like it just you, you sort of like recreate that kind of thing. Um, I think people are just really hungry for nostalgia and doing it in a, you know, in a in a way that sort of can bring everybody together is that's what music's all about, you know. So doing it, doing a balance of of the the artistic kind of stuff and then the the party thing is that's that's sort of been our mo lately there. Cool. Ross, I want to introduce you to producer Lauren here. I feel like I have monopolized this conversation way too much when, in fact, (laughs) producer Lauren actually works with venues quite regularly. She tour manages a lot of different live shows. She's probably seen everything in terms of venues from big, big ones to little, little ones and has put on great shows everywhere. I'm sure you probably got a ton of questions for Roz. I was going to say, my shows tend to fit in slightly different venues. I do mostly live theater. (laughs) Cool, yeah. We uh, do do like burlesque shows. We do drag shows. We do all kinds of stuff at us. Yeah, those would make sense in that venue for sure. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Are you familiar with the Birchmere? Because that's uh, Uh, a... Virginia? Uh, I've never been. I'm, I'm certainly familiar with it, though. Yeah. My brain just goes like, we've done them every other year. So I was like, I know I yeah. fit into that yeah. music venue. They have uh, like ingress and, and that kind of stuff there, if I'm not it's mistaken. It's very, yeah, I was going to say, you guys could have the same artists right, coming through. Right. So I was yeah. like, similar world. Yeah. Um, I, I was entertained at the beginning when he was like, I know you're going to say you love them all. And you were like, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. And I was like, wait, I want to know that side. <laughs> Um, yeah, when you're sifting through all of this stuff, it's, it's nice to know what stands out. What is like a big, don't do this or you're on my auto, not doing that again list. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, I know it's like, 
Other than getting the wrong, the venue name wrong. The venue name wrong. That's always a good one. The copy and paste thing. Where you and that's why it. we really want to play at Brooklyn Ball. Oh, right. so nice to meet you, John. Please call me back. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, it's it's so easy these days to not look super amateur, right? So, like, you know, production value on like you can you can create a great little sizzle or a demo or a little video clip on whatever phone is in your pocket it's like it's such it's an easy thing to do now so taking that time and as a musician there's like it you can't really just be you can't just be a musician anymore if you're gonna if you're gonna try to break through if you're gonna try to push yourself into that next place and and be a professional musician you kind of have to you know, wear a lot of hats and learn how to edit video, learn how to make yourself mm -hmm. sound good, learn a little bit about production. And I mean, I feel like for the most part, it's an easy thing for younger people these days, but it's like those people late twenties, you know, that are kind of in that middle zone of, you know, they're, it's, it's super intuitive to them or they didn't, you know, spend the time with it or whatever. It's uh, making sure that you have something that doesn't look like it was filmed on like a camcorder and you can't really hear everything. <laughs> like there's kind of no excuse for that these days yeah. is sort of how I feel. So that that's one thing that's tough, you know. So at your venue, how much of what happens is provided by the venue and how much are you expecting your artists say to bring in? Like is the back end being done by you? Do you prefer bring the techs and the equipment and yeah, lights so, or yeah, what we is have, it? We have a house production manager and a, and a production team. And, you know, the, we, the, you know, when we reopened, we, we, you know, upgraded our, our sound and video and lighting and it's a really great looking system and it's, it's set up in a way that it can be run sort of in two tiers where it's, you know, one operator can make the whole show look great or you can, you know, if you add a dedicated lighting designer, you can really, make the lights pop. And if you add a, a dedicated video person, you can, you know, there's, there's cameras mounted around the lighting truss and we could stick cameras on stage and there's projection screens. There's one in the smoking area outside, you know, sort of all over the show can go from small to big. And, um, you know, certainly during we, I mean, we were closed for two years, right? You know, we mm -hmm. were we were closed for the pandemic. Plus, a, we were one of the last venues in town to reopen after the pandemic. And um, Denver has changed a lot. I don't know if you've, you know, been here, but downtown is not as enticing to some people. People got older. I certainly did during the pandemic. <laughs> I, have, I have a two-year-old son now, so going downtown at night to me isn't as attractive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it the the built-in thing we sort of it took a little bit to to get that back and it really has, has come back these last few months kind of to where it was um and so it's a nice balance i mean you know the venue is part of a food of, of a restaurant group called edible beats which is oh, cool. you know there's there's four other places in town that are some of the best restaurants in town so they have like there's a there's a relationship with them and and people know what they're going to get. I mean, the food at Ophelia's is insane. It's really, really good. So it's, it's a cool place where you can go to, you know, dinner and a show and both are going to be, you know, high level. It's not just going to be your typical bar food and yeah. a band playing free bird or something, you know? Yeah. Now I want to come visit you guys. Cause that's what I look forward to at the birch mirror. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the venue is fine. That rest, like the, yeah. the chef is so <laughs> yeah. good. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. And yeah, running just... a show, I'm sure you experienced this, right? Running a show when that stuff is passing you mm -hmm. where you're like trying to run, you're like, Ooh, wait. I, right. I, yeah. Yeah. I, a lot of distractions, yeah. <laughs> 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 but it smells too. It's not just, beautiful. yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's exciting. Before we do the final question, Ross, yeah. I, I would be remiss if I didn't call upon some of the different hats that you have worn <laughs> in the industry, other than being the, the venue booker here. Oh, yeah. You, you know, including uh, your tour manager hat. You were Phil Lesh's tour manager for a while. I would imagine that in the course of whether it was managing Lesh's tour or just any of the artists that you've uh, taken on the road, you must have at least one crazy tour management story that you could share with us. I know you have some that you probably, probably can't sure. share with yeah, us, definitely. but um, but do you have one that, that you think would not get us kicked off satellite radio? Yeah, probably could think of at least part of one. Um, you know, <laughs> when when Phil did the um, 
the Fare Thee Well shows. I don't know if you guys are Grateful Dead fans, but they did um, in in 2015. Uh, they did these um, sort of uh, reunion shows, farewell shows, so to speak, where it was the four original members, the and um, uh, Trey from Fish, and Bruce Hornsby and Jeff Comenti, and we did. I think it was two shows at the football stadium and where the Niners play in Santa Clara and then three at soldier field in Chicago. And it was, you know, the most exhausting, crazy experience of my life and really cool looking back on it. Right. But in the moment, very, you know, very hard. (laughs) And the last night it's all over. Everybody's getting ready to leave. You know, there's probably 20 people in Phil's party. It's all winding down and, we're, we're, I'm getting everybody ready to go to the vans and we're going to leave. And I get a call on my walkie talkie that um, Bill Murray wants to come hang out with Phil and never in my, I'm like a huge Bill Murray fan. I like who isn't obviously. Yeah. And never in my life did I think I would be disappointed that Bill Murray wanted to come <laughs> hang. Cause I just You're wanted like, to go oh. back. And, I wanted to go to sleep so bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, he shows oh. up and, and it's like, you know, the party goes from zero to, you know, 600. It was, it was definitely. You, got, you, you had to that's, rally that's, for that's Murray though. Yeah. I mean, of course you're going to, you're going to rally yeah. for Bill, but like I didn't have a lot of rally left in me at the time. <laughs> that's the difference between going to the shows and running the shows. Yeah. By the time yeah. you're I mean, done running, you're like, I'm good. I didn't even see any of the music, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Our guest has been Ross James. He's the booker for Ophelia's Electric Soapbox in Je- uh, in Denver and just uh, has done so many awesome things in this industry. We'd love to. We got to have you back more often because yeah, I'm sure man. you have a m- so many more cool stories just like yeah. that one. Yeah. But we have to bid you good day for this week. But before we let you go, Ross, we'd love to get one more answer out of you if we could. Mm-hmm. It's our final question that we ask all the guests who come on this program. Do you have any last tips for the indie creators out there? to help them move their careers forward. Yeah. I mean, I think it can be a really tough space to navigate these days, you know, and constantly trying to think about how things are going to shift and how you can stay relevant while staying true to yourself is the biggest thing. You know, it's that juggling, juggling what's in your heart and how to make a living off of it. Those are, those are, very, very different things. And the people who are able to sort of find that sweet spot are the people that, you know, you want to be. Seems like you found a lot of sweet spots in your (laughs) career, Roz. Awesome. Thank you so much for your insight. And I'm serious about this. Please don't be a stranger. All right. We need more of those stories. We need more of your great advice. We'd love to have you on again real soon. Love to be back. Thank you. Ross James, everybody. Again, you can find out more about our guest work by going to opheliasdenver.com. What a cool dude. Man, I, that's a great Bill Murray story. I'm so glad we got to end the show with that. I mean, like, yeah, Bill Murray is great and tour life is great, but like the amount of work that they put into that venue post pandemic makes me happy. It's such a great venue. I'm like, venue. where they're like, all right, and so we've got our full camera set up for you here. I mean, if you want to come in and live stream, we can make that happen. Like, I. There was a lot of during the pandemic, we lost this, we lost this, we didn't have time to this. And seeing the venues and the places that took that time to clean themselves up, upgrade, do the work they can't do because there has been people in there nonstop and you didn't have the time to close stuff down. And then after years of not being able to bring profit to still take that energy and that money and put it into the future of that thing that had been shut down, that's what's going to bring it back. And that's what makes me super happy to hear. So good job. It does make me happy. And and here's, cause here's why, right? Uh huh. When you think about the venues that are most likely to not survive the pandemic and you know, the data bear this out, right? You can see like the ones that didn't make it. It's not the really big venues cause they're big enough that they can handle it. And they're usually owned by massive conglomerates that can, you know, weather the storm financially. And it's not the itty bitty venues because they're small enough that they can, you know, they're nimble and can handle the storm. It's the mid-sized venues, particularly the ones that are elaborate and are in very expensive areas and have a lot of stuff going on. Like those are the ones at the greatest risk. And we lost a lot of amazing mid-sized venues through this pandemic. So to see one like Ophelia's 
not only survive, but get even better, but, you know, to, to, to thrive post pandemic, coming up with new things that are creating value for indie creators and for music fans. You love to see it. You love. I want to go to Denver. I know. As if we didn't have enough reasons to go to Denver just to hang out with our co-host, Zach Sloan. We got to hit up Ophelia's. We're going to have to talk to Ross and be like, so you want to bring in a one-man Star Wars show? I bet. You know, I feel like Ophelia's <laughs> would be a great fit for would the totally one-man Star Wars show. Would totally fit my nerdy show. shows. Absolutely. I love my nerdy shows. Okay. Absolutely. All right. We'll talk about that after the show. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thanks to you, producer Lauren. Thanks to our guest, Ross James. And thanks to all of you viewers and listeners for checking out Break the Business. Mwah! We love you. We'll see you next week. 